My name is Judy Adnam. I lecture in um, education at Macquarie University. Today we're going to talk to you about a, a syllabus topic from the National Curriculum, the new New South Wales version, and it's on the environmental movement. So my students will be talking to you about their take on um, it's not easy being green. What's the point of being a global citizen if governments don't take the lead first? And I'll pass you over to Mr Harge, our first speaker. Good morning students and welcome to It's Not Easy Being Green, Protecting the Environment and Being a Global Citizen in 2013. What we'll be doing today is talking a bit about the environment, what kind of problems we're facing today in those terms, and asking what can we do about this problem? Uh, is there any point doing anything? Should governments step up? Should corporations step up? That kind of thing. And my colleagues in the second half of the presentation will be looking at Chernobyl and Fukushima, two serious disasters uh, which relate to nuclear power and production of energy through uh, nuclear means and we'll be applying some of those questions about what can we do today to those case studies. Okay, now if you've got a question or a comment but you don't want to interrupt the presentation, you can join the conversation on Twitter or Instagram using hashtag HVCGreen. So please do that and at the end when we have some time for discussion we will hopefully answer some of your questions. And of course, you will have a chance to raise uh, other questions that you might want to ask. So, the first question that I have for you, are we all global citizens? It's very common these days to talk about global citizenship. What does this mean though? As a citizen of Australia, you obviously have certain rights and you can expect certain things from your society, but you also have certain responsibilities, you know? In world terms, we live in a time of increasing emphasis on human rights, multiculturalism, international trade and environmental responsibility. So what does this mean for the world at large? What are our responsibilities as citizens of the world? Professor Michael Byers has asked, what if anything does it really mean? Is global citizenship just the latest buzzword? And what he means by this, if you look at the images on the right, uh, is what does it mean to be a global citizen? What does it mean? So we've got corporations moving around the world, doing a lot of environmental destruction. Do we have any role in stopping them? What role should they play? Our globalised world still suffers from racism, war, denial of human rights and basic freedoms, and increasing environmental destruction. The questions you've got at the bottom there, who is responsible for fixing the environment? Are all global citizens to blame? And are they all equally responsible? These are the questions we'll be discussing towards the end. What are some of the environmental issues in the world today? In geography, you've probably looked at deforestation, extinction of species, flooding and earthquakes, crop failure and sustainability. And of course, the huge one, climate change. The fact that we're throwing up heaps of pollutants into our atmosphere, the world's heating up, we'll be facing flooding, population problems, all sorts of things. Australia, we've got the carbon tax. If you've been switched on to the news in the past year, you'll know that this is a massive issue in Australia. Who's going to pay for the carbon tax? What are we going to do? The pop mill in Tasmania. Uh, destroying forests, that sort of thing. And of course the big one, nuclear power, which we'll be examining today. Is this really a safe alternative? What implications does this have for the environment? Okay, so there are those questions again. The reason I keep repeating this is because I really want you to be thinking about these questions as you listen to the presentation. Is it up to us? Do we need to change our lifestyle? Do we need to make sacrifices to help the environment? Or should the government step up? We know that the government has heaps of resources that we don't have, so perhaps they should take more of a leading role. And corporations, what about them? We're talking about millionaires, billionaires who make a lot of money out of basically polluting the environment, so what responsibility do they have? The first so-called solution, I guess, that has been you know, commonly talked about and is always raised with people is individual responsibility. The idea that me, you, people like us, we need to change. Now you've got a few images up on the screen there and you probably recognize some of those ideas. So the first one, reuse, reduce, recycle. The idea that, you know, we should be careful what we use, try not to use too much, reuse things where we can, and if we've got things like plastic or paper, we should recycle that so that someone else can use it after us. And in that way, there'll be less pollution. Uh, to the le uh, right, sorry, you've got, please use your shower time wisely. If you spent any amount of time in Australia, you'll know we have a water shortage problem. So the idea is we should take shorter showers, maybe four minute showers, not so much singing or reading newspapers, just get it over and done with so that we don't waste water. 
Same deal with not washing your car. Perhaps you shouldn't wash your car, you should give it a bit of a scrub or something like that. You see someone planting trees on the right, you might have done this in primary school or in geography on an excursion. You know, plant more trees. The forests are being cut down so we need more trees. And of course, buy green. The idea that we should support companies, give to companies which are environmentally sustainable and which take care of the environment. Over time, these companies will become successful, drive the polluters out of business, and we'll have a great environment. So you're probably familiar with a whole range of these issues and these ideas. What are governments doing though? Well, firstly, we've got international treaties to reduce carbon emissions, the most famous which is the Kyoto Protocol of 2005. The idea is that the governments of the world get together, sign an agreement to say, you know, we've got to reduce how much carbon we're putting into the atmosphere, and over time, we will start fixing the climate change problem. Emissions trading schemes, like the European Union trading scheme, very similar. Companies receive pollution permits. So, basically what happens is the government says, you can pollute to this amount if you pay this amount of money. The idea is this will cut into the company's profits, so over time the companies will try to invest in renewable energy, uh, reduce the amount of pollution they emit. In Australia we've got the carbon tax, and this is a really controversial issue, but basically the way it works is that the polluters get taxed based on the amount that they pollute. Again, trying to encourage them to stop polluting to help our environment. And although it's not talked about quite so much anymore, there is a massive debate around switching to nuclear power. So the idea that instead of burning coal for our energy, we can use nuclear energy. And we'll be looking at, in the second half of this presentation, about whether this is really a safe option or not. I've got a few pictures up there just to give you a visual understanding of the different things that governments are doing and the different kinds of proposals. We've got the carbon tax up the top there. Uh, on the right, we've got the Kyoto Protocol with a picture of all the different countries that have signed it. And at the bottom, if you watch The Simpsons, you'll recognize that as the Springfield Nuclear Power Plant. And you'll know that Mr. Burns is a big advocate of nuclear power, and he would be because he makes a lot of money out of it. So, are these methods, individual responsibility, uh, government intervention, are they actually working? I'd like to argue, but you don't have to agree with me, that they're not. And part of the reason is that there is a very close connection between the corporate polluter, that is the industries that pollute, and government. Industrial production and car use account for more than 80% of the pollution caused in our world. They are the absolute leading causes of pollution. However, governments refuse to invest in public transport and renewable energy, and they usually talk about costs. You know, this is too much of a cost to the national economy. And of course, the question of what is a cost and what costs too much comes down to what you're trying to achieve and what your interests are. And we know that the big polluters have a lot of political influence. The energy companies, the auto industry, these people have a lot of sway over our governments. Trading schemes have been criticized because they basically trade in pollution. So what they do is say, look, if you want to pollute, you can pay for it. But really, that just accepts that if a company can make money from polluting, they will pay a small fee and continue doing that. So it's not really helpful to our environment. And of course, the big controversy over the carbon tax, if you've been listening to Tony Abbott and Julia Gillard duke it out over the past year or so, is that it passes the cost onto ordinary consumers through higher prices. Basically, how that works is you've got a tax on the big polluters, but you've got no way to ensure that they won't increase their prices to make sure that they make that money back. So what we get is increased energy bills, gas bills, and of course, increased costs for things like fuel and food. So, you know, that, effect, that affects ordinary people. We end up paying for the environmental destruction that the companies are causing. And of course, with nuclear power, a lot of scientists have argued that it's not necessarily more green. To enrich the uranium that you need to use to produce nuclear energy, you need to burn almost as many fossil fuels as you would using coal. Uh, there's always the risk of nuclear meltdown, and we'll hear about that when we look at Chernobyl and Fukushima. And of course, governments have a whole history of using nuclear power to produce nuclear weapons. And that's something that no one, uh, no one would like to see happening. The image I've got up there is just to give you a sense of just how polluting corporations and industry can be. Nothing that you or I do in our day-to-day -day lives, in you know, heating our homes, driving our car, could possibly compare to the amount of pollution that is being spewed there. And obviously, we do not necessarily benefit from that pollution that's being spewed. We aren't the ones raking in the millions and billions. So, the question is, why does the government keep expecting individual consumers to make sacrifices while it refuses to invest in a sustainable future 
and protects the interests of the major polluters. I'm not going to answer that, but perhaps at the end with the discussion or on Twitter or Instagram, you can pose some of those questions, pose some of those answers as well. And hopefully we'll get back to you. So, what conclusion can we draw uh, from all of this? I guess it is pretty demoralizing. It feels like almost there's nothing we can do about all of this. Should we bother? Why should we do anything? You know, lifestyle changes like wearing different clothes, buying green, uh, not showering as long as we do. These things seem to have little effect if industry is allowed to keep polluting. And of course, like I've already talked about in the carbon tax, the changes that this requires place the burden on us, ordinary people, rather than the biggest polluters. Another thing which I haven't mentioned is that it also asks us to act where we're weakest. Of course, we can buy green, we can reduce our personal consumption, and that's fine. But how does that help us connect with our fellow human beings in a, in a united, collective way to actually change uh, the situation that we have? It doesn't. It asks us to act as isolated individuals going to the shopping market or in our own homes. Um, and I would say that all these measures are inadequate. Reversing climate change, which is the big problem we're facing, would require massive social and political changes. Not something uh, as simple as just buying something different when you go down to the shops. And I'd like to put the idea out there of environmental activism. I won't chime on this, but environmental activism is basically the idea that we need to get together and act in a collective, united way to influence governments and corporations to be more sustainable and to be more environmentally friendly. At the bottom there, you've got a picture of, the, of a protest against, against the Tasmanian pulp mill, which is a very controversial project in Tasmania, a wood processing plant, which will obviously cause a lot of uh, deforestation and destruction to forests and that sort of thing, and people are standing up uh, against this. On the right, we have a much older picture from an anti-nuclear rally in the 60s, um, basically against uranium, against nuclear weapons, against uh, the use of nuclear energy. And we'll see why this kind of thing is really important in a moment. And up top, we've got my favorite example of environmental activism, which is the BLF Green Bands. So the BLF is the Builders Laborers Federation, or was rather. It got uh, deregistered by the government in the 1980s. But what they used to do, basically they were a trade union which covered construction workers, and they refused to build on any site which they thought was not environmentally friendly or would cause uh, environmental destruction. And a large reason why the area of Sydney known as the Rocks, which is uh, near the harbour, is so beautiful today and has so many heritage sites today, is because the BLF refused to let their workers build on these sites when companies wanted to destroy them to put up uh, big offices and high-rise apartments and that sort of thing. So I'll just leave it, with, uh, leave it at that and I'll pass to my colleague, Ms Anderson, who will talk to you about Chernobyl. Good morning class, my name is Ms Anderson. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the Chernobyl nuclear accident that occurred on April 26, 1986 in reactor number four. It occurred in the Ukraine, which was part of the USSR Russia at the time, and occurred because there was a flaw in the reactor design and some operator error. However, one of the big reasons why it was so harmful to everybody was that reactors at that time in Russia were not built with those large concrete cones that you saw in that wonderful Simpson picture. And those concrete cones were designed in the West to um, it should there be any radiation leak from any power plant um, to stop that radiation leak. The power plant in Chernobyl did not have anything like that and so there was a large release into the atmosphere. So much so that it actually affected large parts of Europe and you can see on the map exactly how far this went throughout Europe. Sweden was some of the first people to see some of the radiation fallout. Primarily in the Ukraine, you can see the black dot, that's where Chernobyl actually is located. Um, at the time, they evacuated uh, 45,000 people on the first day and then up to 220,000 people, creating a 30 kilometer radius exclusion zone around Chernobyl. So nobody could live, work there at all after the accident occurred. Now we move on to the health effects. 28 of the 600 plant workers died um, within the first four months from acute radiation poisoning. Uh, 106 plant workers received the sickness but didn't die. However, one of the major problems with radiation is the contamination that occurs over time. And there have been over 6,000 cases of thyroid cancer in children in the, in the area since up to about 2005. 
how do they get contaminated? Well, the radiation obviously is in the air. It then um, leaks down onto the topsoil and affects crops, which then in turn affects the food chain. Um, cows eat the grass that's contaminated and then the milk is then contaminated and the children drink the milk. And so there's actually ongoing effects over time that radiation occur, that radiation leakage occurs. And now my friend, Mr. Adams, is going to tell you about another nuclear disaster, Fukushima. Hi everyone, my name is Mr. Adams and I'll be talking to you about Fukushima Daiichi, a Japanese nuclear plant which went into meltdown. Uh, so in March 2011, there was actually a large tsunami which devastated the Japanese coastline. And uh, part of that was widespread flooding and earthquakes. So uh, what actually happened was that the flooding took out the backup generators in the nuclear plant, which causes uh, the cooling to fail which leads to the core heating up and then widespread nuclear disaster when the nuclear materials leaked into the environment. So a government investigation committee actually found out that this was actually a man-made disaster. So it, it brings up issues about whether any environmental disaster can be truly natural uh, because governments are basically responsible for uh, ensuring that there's no serious safety flaws in these nuclear plants. And if they fail to do that, then really to what extent can we say that it's a truly natural disaster? Uh, another example would be earthquakes and stuff in uh, the US where governments cut costs by refusing to earthquake proof their buildings. So some buildings are much more devastated by the earthquake than others. Same deal here where they found out serious safety flaws in the nuclear plant were actually responsible for the disaster rather than just the tsunami alone. Uh, luckily for the Japanese, uh, the disaster was not as bad as it could have been. It's the only level 7 nuclear event since Chernobyl, but luckily theirs was actually encased in concrete, unlike the plant in the Ukraine, which meant that a lot of the radiation could be contained. Uh, the predicted deaths from the event uh, in the long term are low to none. However, there is an increased chance of thyroid cancers and other problems in infants. Uh, and another thing is that very recently, in the last month actually, they found out that tons and tons of radioactive water is currently leaking into uh, the ocean there. So the problem is actually ongoing. Uh, we have to question government responses in these kinds of events and we have to say that it was found fairly wanting in this case. Uh, the government was very poor with their response uh, and issued public misinformation constantly, actually causing people to evacuate to more contaminated areas in their escape. Uh, and another thing was that they actually used uh, the private company TEPCO, which is a Tokyo power company. Uh, they were trusted to clean up, uh, and they lied to the public continually about how safe the situation was and whether it was still dangerous. In 2013, when they found out about, about all that leaking water, the government finally decided they lost trust in TEPCO and decided to take over themselves. But the public has been genuinely uh, disinterested in the government's response. Uh, since, TEP, since the TEPCO lost in trust, just because the government's response has been so contradictory. Uh, and there you can see an anti-nuclear protest in Japan. I put that in uh, because, as Mr. Hadd was saying, uh, this is one of the ways that people have decided to try and counter these kinds of problems. Uh, when individual situations, when individual solutions, rather, are found to be not sufficient, people get out there and they protest against nuclear power and these kinds of things in a form of people power, and that may be one of the solutions to these pro green problems. So the media is one of the most powerful forces in society when it comes to understanding these problems. And they shape the responses of governments, organizations, groups, and individuals. Uh, so we're going to look at some of the media coverage around these events and compare Chernobyl and Fukushima Daiichi in this regard. So Chernobyl was subject to what we call the Cold War effect, where the division between the East and West, between Russia and the US uh, caused a lot of communication problems because Russia was largely closed off, or the USSR as it was then. So Mikhail Gorbachev, the president of the Soviet Union at the time, he wasn't actually informed until 12 hours after the incident occurred. And some of the ways that the West first found out about the incident was actually through Sweden, uh, when the Swedish power plant workers uh, first went in and worked out that, hey, our radiation levels are way higher than they should be, uh, and started calling around Europe uh, looking for where the problem was, only to find out that the only place they couldn't call was probably the site of the, the problem. Uh, so we had that effect going on there. 
uh, whereas the media in Fukushima were much more involved uh, because the internet exists by now, we have 24 hour news cycle, people are much more, uh, well hopefully much more informed and able to respond immediately through Twitter and these kinds of things. So we have a few social media responses uh, that occurred during the Fukushima event and in the aftermath. So we can see here, we have some reports about the 300 tons of radioactive water entering the Pacific Ocean uh, every single day. Uh, we have uh, a variety of people who are trying to process this information and put in with their opinion. So another one we have here is the reactor cores have apparently hit the groundwater. Say goodbye to fresh salmon, Portland kids. Uh, just showing how widespread these effects can be, spreading even to America very quickly. So if we compare the coverage, we can see that there are some commonalities between them. Uh, and one of the most common things was actually a misuse of a bunch of scientific terms or generalizations. The best example is probably meltdown, which gets thrown around a lot by the media because it has no scientific meaning. It basically means whatever the media wants it to mean, uh, which often is what's most scary. Uh, so these kinds of words end up shaping the debates around the public, uh, who generally don't have access to the same kind of technical information that, others, that governments can. But some of the differences, the main differences that we need to draw out, would be the controlled press that existed in Russia during the Cold War versus the free press in Japan. These things led to widespread criticism of the Tokyo Power Company much more quickly than was the case in Russia. Uh, and another thing would be uh, just the massive impact that the internet has had on media since then, with people able to weigh in from all around the world immediately in the aftermath of the disaster. So what can we draw from all this? What are some of the major things that we need to consider? Well, first of all, can governments be trusted to prevent or clean up environmental disasters? Uh, the Japanese government's constant turning to TEPCO, the private company that's actually covered up most of their poor, uh, poor cleanup, is one of the best examples we can see to say that maybe they can't. Maybe the people need to do something about this themselves. But what should that solution be? Can we as individuals actually do anything about the environment or disasters? I'm not going to answer that question. I think this is something that should be discussed in the classroom. But I think we can see that there are numerous solutions that people have come to. Uh, the individual solutions that Mr. Hodge was uh, detailing, such as reduce, reuse, recycle, they're one way. One way which may not be effective. Another way would be the kinds of protests that we've detailed, stuff like the anti-nuclear protests in, J uh, in Japan as well as the actions of the BLF trade union, uh, we need to ask ourselves, what can we do about companies that pollute and then cover it up? What can we do about the companies that pollute for profit, basically? And what is the role of the media in all this? Sometimes they act to inform us as individuals, sometimes they aid in misinformation. These are the kinds of questions that need to be talked about by students in the classroom, in engaging with the world around them and becoming active global citizens. So I encourage everyone to get on Twitter or Instagram or to discuss this in their classrooms and talk about these kinds of issues because they are central to the survival of humans and society. So if you're interested in issues such as this, or if you want to learn more, I highly encourage uh, study at the tertiary level. Uh, you can look more in our pamphlets, there's a website there, uh, and go on and find out how you can become involved as an active citizen and fight against these kinds of things. Thank you. I'd like to thank my students who will be your teachers of the future. They start teaching next year. Um, they're in their final year of study at Macquarie University and as you can see they've put a lot of thought into the whole environment movement through their study in the teacher education program. So thank you very much students and thank you and enjoy the discussion back in class.